on this Thursday installment of Locked On Texans crossover edition of the podcast as we will be joined by Locked On Broncos as we discuss the top matchups and storylines surrounding the week two match against the Houston Texans and the Denver Broncos. You are Locked On Texans, your daily Houston Texans podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Thursday all across the Locked On Podcast Network. So for the NFL season, you know exactly what that means. It is crossover Thursday. We have Locked On Broncos talking with Locked On Texans about Sunday's big time matchup. 225 p.m. Mountain Time kickoff. The Denver Broncos will host the Houston Texans. I'm Cody Rourke, host of Locked On Broncos, joined alongside by Locked On Texans host Cody Davis. This is the Cody Show today's <laughs> crossover episode, my man. Obviously, uh, very excited to, to welcome you here. Can't wait to break down welcoming the Texans audience and also for Texans fans tuning in. They get to hear a little bit of a Broncos perspective, man. So, Cody, I want to start things off here with this crossover here today by really setting it up. For the Houston Texans, what is the biggest story for them this week as a team heading into this matchup? Can they actually bounce back from not a loss? but a tie (laughs) that is the number one storyline heading into this game and you know you have to look at it from two different perspectives you know of course here in the city of houston it's been a split um point of conversation you know whether or not coach lovey smith made the right decision to settle for a tie and when you go back and you take a look at everything that led up to coach smith decision to say you know what i'm I'm fine don't want to lose this game i want to settle for a tie the one thing he talked about was everything that was that had led up to that decision which means the fact that the houston texans blew a 20 to 3 lead the fact that they gave up 200 and something yards in the fourth quarter to the indianapolis Colts, and also the fact that the Colts actually miss their opportunity to win this football game because of the missed field goal. However, with all that being said, the number one thing that I was looking into going into week one was whether or not a potential win or a potential loss was going to set up the set up the atmosphere for the entire season. And that caught my attention because the one thing I remember um, defensive end Jonathan Gennard saying is the fact that this game against the Indianapolis Colts, whether we win or lose, is going to show us what we are working with for this entire season. Well, in the first three quarters, it seems like you was working with something good. The fourth quarter, it seemed like you was like, like, like you was a rebuilding team. And in overtime, you settle for a tie. So we're kind of back at square one to say, okay, will the Houston Texans be better than what we expect? Or would they still be one of the worst teams in the league? I I think that's an interesting thing to set up. I know for me, when I was watching that game, I was tuning in because I wanted to see running back Damian Pierce from a scouting Mm -hmm. perspective. I wanted to see Davis Mills because at the end of last season, I was watching him in the red zone. He had the highest passer rating in the red zone amongst quarterbacks last year. And I think that was an impressive sign. There was things that they built upon. I'm a big Pep Hamilton fan. I think that he's been a huge proponent of quarterback success. And so I was very tuned into this game, not to mention, you know, I did have uh, the Colts on the money line and I was hoping that my (laughs) bet wasn't going to fall through. So they did make it interesting in that fourth quarter. But for the biggest story here for this Denver Broncos football team is also a week of kind of some questions from the fan base, questions from the media about Broncos head coach Nathaniel Hackett's decision to try to kick a 64-yard field goal to try to win the game against the Seahawks versus letting Russell Wilson go for it on fourth and five. There's been the mental gymnastics that we've been playing all week on our end. But for this Denver Broncos football team, the biggest story this week as it pertains to themselves at going against this Houston Texans team, can they come into week two playing more disciplined football to open up the season on Monday Night Football? They had 12 penalties that accounted for over 120 yards lost. They gave, Seattle Seahawks had 19 first downs in a game. Seven of them were due to penalties by the Denver Broncos. So that was not an ideal situation for the Broncos to find themselves in. But also, it was the turnovers in the red zone. The Broncos had the ball on the one-yard line twice in this game. And then Melvin Gordon, Javante Williams, Each of those guys had a fumble that cost them points and cost them an opportunity to win the football game. So for them, it's how can the offense bounce back? Even though they put up over 430 plus total yards of offense, the production, the point totals 
were not there that matched that output. So it's a big week for this Broncos team against the Houston Texans. And more so, we found out earlier this week, Justin Simmons placed on mm-hmm. injured reserve for the Broncos defensively. A massive blow for them on the back end of the Broncos secondary unit. Obviously a captain for them. And now they're going to have to replace his production by having some other guys step up and fill in at his position. But these two storylines for both of these teams, Cody, will set the table, I think, for this matchup on Sunday when all the action kicks off. And for Broncos fans, for Texans fans, coming up here in just a moment, Cody and I, we are also going to break down the key matchups that we are looking forward to most seeing in Sunday's action between the Denver Broncos and the Houston Texans. But before we get into that, let us tell you about Turo, the sponsor of today's episode, Locked On Broncos, Locked On Texans crossover series. And Turo is the world's largest car sharing marketplace and with Turo you can book any car you want whether you want it from a community of local hosts you can browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget across the U.S. Canada and the U.K. You can book a spacious SUV or minivan for a family road trip you can get a classic or luxury car for a special event a birthday or holiday you can find affordable economy cars if you're on a budget and just need to get from A to B test drive that new electric vehicle that you've had your eye on to see how it fits in your everyday life and many Turo hosts can even deliver the car right to you every trip is backed by liability insurance terms conditions and exclusions apply so ditch the boring rental cars and find your drive at turo.com continuing on with our lockdown broncos locked on texans crossover event here for week two across the locked on podcast network thank you everyone for making lockdown broncos or locked on texans your first listen of the day every single day free and available everywhere you get your podcast or whether you watch both shows on YouTube. We appreciate you so much. Continuing our conversation here, Cody, from a locked on Texans perspective, what are some key matchups? Are there it could be one key matchup, it could be two that you have your eye on the most here for your Houston Texans against the Denver Broncos this upcoming Sunday? The one matchup or two matchups that I'm looking at, and they kind of go hand in hand. Um, Corden Sutton, Jerry Judy versus Derek Stanley and Steven Nelson. You know, throughout this whole entire year, as a matter of fact, you know, ever since the Houston Texans got the number three overall pick, everyone in their mind knew that the Houston Texans were going to address um they was going to address one of their top priorities, which is the secondary. And they did that, of course, by drafting Derek Stanley Jr. Now, Derek Stanley Jr. did have a pretty solid debut against the Indianapolis Colts. I understand he did give up a few receptions, but of course, it was his very first game. He is still trying to get adjusted to the NFL level. But what I would say is he did finish that game with seven tackles. And to me, he was one of the saviors of the Indianapolis Colts game because had he not recorded a touchdown pass deflection between Matt Ryan and rookie wide receiver um, Alex Pierce, then the Indianapolis Colts would have left NRG Stadium with the victory. But the fact that he was able to get his hand on that ball, that basically saved the game for the Houston Texans. And of course, I'm pretty sure you saw it. Lovey Smith called them up and said, hey, we're going to take you. We're going to have you cover the number one wide receiver for this upcoming season. And, of course, on the opposite side of the line of scrimmage, you're looking at Jerry Judy, a guy that literally is coming off a game where he had, what, 105, 110 receiving yards. And, of course, now you are pairing him with a Hall of Fame quarterback in Russell Wilson. I think that this is going to be a phenomenal season for Jerry Judy. And, of course, you know, hopefully that breakout game does not come against the Houston Texans. And, of course, that is going to be whether or not or how much I should say um, Derek Stingley is going to be able to contain him. And, of course, on the opposite side, it's not like that you could just worry about Jerry Judy. You also got to worry about Corden Sutton. And I've been saying this ever since the Houston Texans signed this young man. Steven Nelson, as at, at, at least as for right now, he has been one of, if not the Texans' best offseason acquisition. Not only is he showing it on the field, but he is showing it off the field as well, showing Derek Stingley the ropes. And this is a guy who is one of the leaders in the locker room, and he's he, and he's still a productive player. And in order for the Houston Texans to be able to come out with a victory against the Denver Broncos, they're going to have to contain the Broncos' top two receivers. 
Well, and another question I have for you, too, as it pertains to like an offensive matchup, right? For Davis Mills, who's running the offense there in Houston, are there any matchups in particular you're also looking forward to, whether it be Davis Mills, whether it be Damian Pierce, whether it be Rex Burkhead, who <laughs> just seems to find a way to be heavily involved in offensive game plans going forward? It's not too much of a matchup that I'm looking at in terms of, of Davis Mills, but what I do want to say in terms of Davis Mills going into this game, I want to know how is he going to be able to improve his ability to create something out of nothing. And by that, I mean, when he is being pressured, you know, when you, when you go back to that game against the Indianapolis Colts, there were several times where he did not handle the pressure well. And he said something very interesting during his media availability on yesterday. He said that he watched the Seattle Seahawks and Denver Broncos game. And he said that what he noticed about Geno Smith was every time the Broncos pressured him he was able to use his leg and move around in the pocket and in 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 to to be able to still make something out of nothing and when i take a look at davis mills yes he has the ability to do so but a lot of time he is a statue and that puts a lot of pressure on the offensive line and he said that is something that he wants to work on so going into week two i'm holding him by his words to see whether or not that is something that he's going to improve at from a lockdown Broncos perspective, some of the key matchups I'm most looking forward to seeing here. I think for the Broncos defensively, I think they have to find a way to limit O.J. Howard because in the week one opening game hmm. against the Seattle Seahawks, the Broncos allowed two touchdown passes to two different tight ends. Well, O.J. Howard had two catches for two, I think it was like 22, 24 yards, but two of his catches were for two touchdowns in the game against the Indianapolis Colts, which gave them obviously 14 points off of that. The Broncos historically have struggled in recent memory against tight ends, versatile, athletic, sizable tight ends. And kind of going to your point about Geno Smith, his escapability, making plays happen, you know, when things break down, he did just that and he was able to find tight ends. So I think our, our kind of key matchups align a little bit with the impact of maybe how certain things can go on field here. And certainly for the Broncos, they have to find a way to account for OJ Howard, but I'm going to go with a little bit more of an exciting matchup here, Cody Patrick Sertan taking on Brandon cooks. Who's got some long hmm. speed to him, some dynamic ability to him. Obviously, in my opinion, I think the Texans best wide receiver, we saw him play against DK Metcalf and kind of to your point about Derek Stingley, Derek Stingley didn't allow any explosive plays to the Indianapolis Colts. Patrick Sertan played against DK Metcalf, didn't allow any explosive plays and held him to 37 yards total in Monday's loss, unfortunately, to the Seattle Seahawks. He's entering his second year as a pro. So I imagine we talk about like really young, exciting corners. You look at Derek Stingley now with the Houston Texans. You look at Patrick Sertan now with the Denver Broncos. I think that'll be a fun matchup to watch here for Denver, but a huge question and a huge matchup that I honestly have my eyes fixated on in this game has to be the Broncos edge rushers against Houston's offensive line, right? There's Laramie Tunsil, who's been a stakeholder for them at the left tackle position. What does the Texans offensive line look like here when they're going against guys like Randy Gregory and Bradley Chubb and Chubb coming off of a very impressive two sack performance against the Seattle Seahawks? Here's the thing. They don't even know. Because they still dealing with communication issues. And I say that because, you know, going back to Sunday's game against the Indianapolis Colts, there was a lot of times where it was easy to tell that that, that the offensive line unit, unit wasn't on the same accord. And on Monday, not Monday, Tuesday, when we had an opportunity to talk to Justin Britt, um, whose status is in the air right now because he's dealing with something personal, so we might not even have an opportunity to see him. But when we had an opportunity to talk to him Tuesday during his media availability, um, Justin Britt talked about how the communication with the offensive line unit wasn't there. And he also talked about how it kind of hurt the hurt the offensive line that majority of those guys like the Laramie Tunsil, like Justin Britt, did not play during the preseason in, in terms of getting back to that communication, getting back to that chemistry and camaraderie. And that's one of the things that I was kind of worried about, especially for a guy like Laramie Tunsil. Yes, he is still one of the best left tackles in the game, but Sunday was his very first game um, playing playing in the game since October, I think it was like 25th or somewhere along those lines, week five during the 2021 <laughs> campaign. And for me personally, going into the offseason, going into training camp and all this other stuff, like, yes, they had a lot of time on the practice field, but 
Cody, you know, there is nothing like getting in game reps. And the fact that majority of the most important guys on that offensive line did not or barely played throughout the preseason, it, it hurt the Texans on Sunday. And I do believe it's going to hurt them again. Cause as I mentioned, Justin Britt, due to personal reason, he's not going to be there. And that's your starting center. Now, look, maybe, um, Titus Howard, Laramie Tunsil, because they finally just need, maybe they just needed that one game in hopes of getting their communication and everything back on track. But at the same time, look, you guys got a very scary defensive front. And I, this is going to be a very hard task for the Houston Texans offensive line. Well, you know, I think the, the Broncos are also dealing with a lot of questions after week one about not playing any of the starters in the preseason. You know, I, I always believe that there's like the pros and cons. And certainly I think game reps are absolutely important. Mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like when you have a team that has the players like Denver, you know, and we saw what happened to Zach Wilson in the preseason. Luckily, mm -hmm. you know, the New York Jets, they're going to be OK. They're going to overcome that eventually. They got to deal with Joe Flacco in the meantime, which I'm not <laughs> jealous of in that situation. Denver was already in that boat. But I do think that this is going to be a matchup that is going to have a lot of interesting storylines coming into the game and for the Broncos how can you maybe have someone step up in place of Justin Simmons on the back end I mean he's your best defensive player outside of Patrick Sertan and Bradley Chubb who you know in the last couple of years back-to-back -back seasons of five interceptions that's going to be a huge huge question heading into this matchup but as it pertains to maybe what the Broncos or what the Texans need to do in order to come out on top for a victory that's something we're going to dive deep into coming up here in just a moment but before we do that let me tell you about betonline.net the sponsor of today's crossover episode here on the Lockdown Podcast Network and betonline.net is your number one source for all your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season you can find all the latest football league developments game matchups news and podcasts including this year's opening week games betonline is your continued source for all your sports wagering Information including live betting, esports, and scores. The fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MLB, MMA, boxing, and golf. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet online where the game starts. Continuing on with your Locked On NFL podcast, crossover edition, Locked On Broncos and Locked On Texans. Cody Rourke here and Cody Davis. This is the Cody Show on the Locked On Podcast Network. We got things going here, breaking down the Denver Broncos matchup against the Houston Texans from both teams' perspectives. So, Cody, let me start off by asking you this. From the Locked On Texans perspective, what do the Texans need to do to come into Empower Field at Mile High on Sunday and get the Broncos off to an 0-2 start? What do they have to do in order to win? Well, one, and this is, of course, the most important thing because it doesn't matter what they do on either side of the ball. The number one thing is how do you contain Russell Wilson? This is a guy who is 3-0 against the Houston Texans as of right now. And I could be wrong, but outside of Rex Burkhead, I don't think there's not one player in that locker room who has ever beaten Russell Wilson. Um, you know, the, we had an opportunity to talk to Steven Nelson on, on Tuesday, and he said that Russell Wilson is one of the hardest quarterbacks to prepare for because, you know, on one hand, he's a pocket, he, you know, he's a pocket quarterback, but on the other hand, he's a dual threat. So, you know, if you put too much pressure on him, he can get out of it and he can still, he's one of those quarterbacks I love saying he could create something out of nothing. And I go back to the game last year against the Seattle Seahawks and I watch Russell Wilson attack the Houston Texans Tampa two defense. And he did something that every quarterback did, but it seemed like he did it better. And that was attack that Tampa two defense down the middle middle. And when I take a look at what Lovey Smith said about the enhancements that he made to his defense, I say, okay, I hear you Lovey Smith, but yes, last year, Russell Wilson destroyed the Texans inside of NRG Stadium, attacking that Tampa 2 defense down the middle. Middle, You say you made enhancements? I want to see enhancement. And I already know that Russell Wilson is probably going to go into Sunday's game against the Texans and saying, you know what, I'm going to just do what I did last year, attack them down the middle, and it's going to be an easy It's going to be an easy victory for the Denver Broncos. That's one thing and by far the number one thing that the Texans have to do in hopes of getting this dub. Another thing. They say they want to be a running team. You got to play your best running back. There is no way in hell we should still see Rex Burkhead getting more carries than Damian Pierce. I understand it. I get it. 
I understand Damian Pierce has a way to go in terms of, you know, using him as a pass catcher out of the backfield, as a as a pass blocker or whatever the case might be. I understand all that. I understand he's still trying to learn learn majority of the playbook. But at the end of the day, you want to get that first down and you and you keep saying we can't establish the run. We can't establish the run. We can't establish the run. Every time you say we can't establish the one, there's only one running back that is always in this common denominator, and that's Rex Burkhead. If you want to establish the run, please use your most talented running back in Damian Pierce. It's not that hard. I, I love that, too, because, like I said, I thought Damian Pierce put together a very impressive preseason format, and, yes, and I like his work, especially in college. Now, that, I mean, that'll be a challenge for this Denver Broncos team. So now from a lockdown Broncos perspective, if the Broncos are going to want to win this game against the Houston Texans to get off to a one-on-one start on the season offensively, it has to be more disciplined. You have to be able to finish if you get in the red zone. The Broncos had four red zone trips and were 0 for 4. They had a fumble. They had another fumble in back-to-back drives. They had an incomplete pass where, you know, the tight end Eric Thomason barely just had his foot on the line and unfortunately, it would have been out of bounds on a touchdown pass that would potentially would run the game. And then you have to eliminate penalties. The Broncos had one touchdown that was eliminated offensively, a shovel pass to Andrew Beck because of a false start penalty that backed them up, forcing them to settle for a field goal that put them in a position to trail 17 to 16 against Seattle. You just have to be more disciplined and have to find a way to finish when you're in the red zone. Now for the defensive side of the ball, it's quite simple. You have to get back to the basics. You have to get back to playing disciplined assignment football. Denver had several drives last week against the Seattle Seahawks as well, Cody, where they got a stop on third down, but then they got a penalty, whether it be you know a rough in the passer call, whether it be a taunting penalty that extended the Seahawks drive. You can't, you can't have penalties on the defensive side of the ball, and you must be a little bit more disciplined in diagnosing where O.J. Howard and the tight ends are, and you have to find a way to eliminate those big plays from happening. You mentioned it earlier. One of the key things, can Davis Mills get out of the pocket and make things happen with his legs? Denver has to be able to account for that. They just can't come into this matchup thinking, okay, Davis Mills is just going to be a statue guy. He's going to be a pocket passer. He's got the ability to get outside and to hurt you, and Denver must come home, stay disciplined, and play assignment football, in my opinion, if they want to to win the ball. But Cody, let's recap this for the listeners of the Locked On Broncos podcast, Locked On Texans podcast, free and available everywhere. People get their podcasts or whether they watch both shows on YouTube. For the Broncos, the biggest story of the week heading into this game is Justin Simmons being placed on injured reserve. Who steps up in the back end of that secondary? And can Denver be more disciplined after committing too many mistakes against the Seattle Seahawks? That was one of the biggest keys. We also highlighted key matchups for this Broncos team. Patrick Sertan going against Brandon Cooks, the Texans' number one wide receiver, and also accounting for where O.J. Howard is lined up. Offensively, find ways to punch it in, be more consistent. That was the the perspective from the Broncos. From the Texans' side, what did we recap? (laughs) First and foremost, how can the results of this game, hopefully not a tie, can actually set the tone for the Houston Texans moving forward? Of course, the biggest matchup everybody is looking at Jared Judy versus Derek Stingley Jr. And of course, what is the number one thing that the Houston Texans must do in hopes of getting their first victory of the 2022 campaign? Can you contain Russell Wilson and not let him beat you attacking that Tampa 2 defense down the middle? And of course, just give the ball to Damian Pierce and just get Rex Burkhead out of the way, please. (laughs) That's a big one. And obviously... If you're a Broncos fan, sound off in the comments below. If you're a Texas fan, sound off in the comments below. If you're watching this on the Locked On Broncos or Locked On Texans YouTube page. But this has been a crossover Thursday powered by our good friends over there at Price Picks. Make sure you check out pricepicks.com and make sure you use promo code Locked On to receive a 100% deposit match bonus when you sign up today. Daily Fantasy Sports done right. Cody, I'm looking forward to Sunday's matchup Hmm. against the Houston Texans from a Broncos perspective. I'm excited that I was able to break this matchup down with you. Broncos fans learned a lot from the Texans perspective, and I hope Texans fans learned a lot from the Broncos perspective. Going into week two, 2.25 p.m. Mountain Time kickoff, 4.25 p.m. Eastern Time kickoff on CBS.